Hey there, welcome to this episode of the Event Manager Podcast by Skiff Meetings. I'm Miguel Nevsh and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Skiff Meetings. This episode is all about why event planners need humane event tech. And I have the pleasure of speaking with event technologist and educator, Nick Borelli. The conversation revolves around the challenges with event technology and how a human and planner-centric approach is needed for event tech to succeed. We cover things like the radical differences between planners and event technologists the unique and stress-inducing needs of event planners when it comes to technology. Why we need to really be able to unlock event data to make better decisions for an entire organization. We talk about the current state of the metaverse and how it may develop over the next few years. And we talk about some of the challenges that remain for the next generation of event technology. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation and don't forget to check out the other episodes of the Event Manager Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Event Manager Podcast by Skiff Meetings. Today, I am delighted to have with me Nick Borelli. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Super excited to be on as a proper guest. Uh, I was the first, I think, uh, sponsor uh, of the podcast. Super, super excited about being on it proper uh, because I've been a fan of it and even before it was a thing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you've been on on two episodes before, right? As yeah. a sort of sponsored guest, and now you get you get a whole episode to yourself. Which is, <laughs> yeah, I'll which take is awesome, it, which, which you more than deserve. So, um, would love to start just for, by an introduction. I, I, you know, I don't need a, a whole life story because I think we could be here for a long time. But just so people know, if people don't know who you are, then uh, give them a little bit of a taste of your journey uh, in events and meetings. Yeah, yeah. So my journey uh, starts uh, in when I'm a teenager, and I uh, I'm really, really into the internet uh, in in the early '90s, text only browsing. Uh, I was in like bulletin boards and Usenet groups, uh, and just was really into the community part of it. Mostly, frankly, because there wasn't anybody into X Files or Star Trek uh, in my uh, you know around me. So I was like, let's go find a community that is. Uh, so I got really into that, and then. Uh, I started building websites because people were polymaths at that time, uh, not a lot of specialists. And I, I started building websites when I was 14 years old uh, for a marketing agency. And uh, in addition to that, my my dad said, you know, you should get a real job because this internet thing seems like it's going to be a fad. So um, <laughs> he got me a job in hospitality uh, as a dishwasher, you know, like really pulled some strings to get me a, a top level position. Uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> I... Uh, uh, started in, in catering and hospitality and events in that way. And, you know, over the years I've stayed in events and I've stayed in the digital. I, I for the longest time I was, I was in sales and marketing for hospitality companies in the, in the late nineties and early two thousands. Uh, and then I was also doing freelance web design. Uh, primarily I made a, a freelance business off of, uh, making bridal, uh, show, uh, websites and uh, like marketing plans because like the it was it was a great business I thought because it was scalable. Um, whatever worked for one would work for any other one, and there are no competition. You know, you don't you don't go between the 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 Charlotte and the Los Angeles bridal show. You just stay in your market. So I could repeat the same package. So I learned that, and then I started speaking uh, in the two thousands. The first show I was started speaking at was uh, Cater Source. Uh, and, and then eventually the special event. And over the years, I just started merging what I, what I loved about digital and what I love about in person, uh, and finding that there was tons of overlap in the community and the, and the design elements of it. And, uh, I just kind of built a little career off of, uh, being, you know, kind of a dual citizen. (laughs) <laughs> I love it. And and you can kind of, at least I can definitely sense a little bit of the tension between the the digital and the and the kind totally. of live event space throughout that that kind of story in your career. I've lived in that awkward space in between. I've I've done my best to try to uh it's funny, most people in the tech space, which we know a lot of those people, they have like all if you get them, you know, cornered somewhere where they're not on the record, they'll say all kinds of things about planners that are less than awesome. You know, like they'll say, you know, things that alluding to Luddites and alluding to, uh, you know, lack of understanding of this and that. But I'll be honest with you, it's as bad, if not worse on the other side, as far as their understanding of what makes live events tick and what makes planners tick. There, There's a lot of work to be done uh, between getting those two groups of people together on the same page. Yeah, I hear you. I think... I often hear recommendations or challenges or suggestions from the tech side that are 
not only unrealistic, but just not practical because of how time specific events are and how many yeah. details you know have to go right and you really can't afford any any kind of you can't do a b testing in a live event in mo of, for most things right I think you can't <laughs> yeah it's funny like i think of the word failure as as kind of like my uh maybe the the rosetta stone to like understanding those two groups where one embraces it so much so that i would say every 10 ted talks ends up being about failure and how great it is that's technology mm -hmm. and then events it's uh it, you may as well replace the word failure with death like it, it is, <laughs> there is there's nothing positive whatsoever in failure there's no learning lessons it's the worst you know it, they they immediately uh, never talk about it again and move on like it didn't happen. Like there's zero learning lessons. So um, yeah, there's a lack of empathy all around on both sides of that. Frankly, that I think walking a mile in in either shoe would be useful, which I've done, uh, and that's one of the things that I, I leverage is the fact that like I, I kind of speak both languages, uh, and I I try to get down to the the, the sort of um, emotional core of both sides in order to create some uh, communication that is beneficial to both goals. Love that. Um, I mean, I've definitely been guilty of that. I've been on moderating panels where I've asked people to talk about failures and you never get a straight answer. No. Uh, you know, as no. much as even if you can lead by example and talk about a failure or somewhere you learn, you get this sort of quasi failure that always ends up in the person being interviewed talking about how they turned it around and made everything yeah. amazing um yeah just never but in events it's like or in tech it's the other way around right where you're just like oh yeah we we absolutely thought this was going to be like this uh you know this is the market fit we put all this money into it you know more money than people put into the you know any given event for sure and they're like yeah. it just didn't happen you know uh so we went back to the drawing board and it's like you don't hear that tone uh, see for me it's the tone and the and the emotion around it like if you hear that that same story from events uh from planners who it, it's uh it's it's very depressing <laughs> it's not it's not this like fun thing i'm like oh we absolutely dropped all balls we could drop uh but you know look at us today we're still here that's not <laughs> how they yeah, say I, it in the events world to be honest i'd love to hear from the platter side if, if anybody has some insights into this when, when you hear a tech person talk like that does it just sound incredibly unprofessional uh scary you know side of all of the above kind of thing because to me it sounds refreshing in many ways because you're kind of saying hey we bet on this we tried it it didn't work now we know it doesn't work so now we're going to bet somewhere else and hopefully the company's still doing well enough that you can make some more bets um but yeah like you say when it comes to events you can't really do that because in most situations you're sort of betting the farm at every event and then if you make a big mistake that's it you don't get tech, tech puts chips down on a bunch of different numbers spins you know never gets as big of a payout maybe necessarily but certainly uh it, it just they have other things moving and uh you know, events put it all in one chip, you know, one day, one, one, one landing. Uh, and if it doesn't roll on that, you lose all the, you know, you lose everything. And uh, it, it's, it's very, it's very risky uh, for that. But like, I mean, event planners, I want to let you know that those tech people are thinking about failure, like that you're hiring those people too. So those people uh, who have ability to uh, make impact on, on your experience, like they don't think like you, like there, there's a possibility that what they do, what they provide to you doesn't go right. And yeah. their feeling of that is, well, you know, we learned a lot from that and they'll come to you and say that like, oh, you know, sorry about how that happened. We, we learned a lot next time. And you're just like, whoa, why would there be a next time? I'm never going to work with you again. And you <laughs> failed, you know, and they're like, what do you mean? Like, think yeah. you could have gone with anybody and only get even day. Some of the biggest platforms have failed like hugely in the last couple of years. Um, but that, that's not weird. Like that's that's tech. Like It, it does that. Uh, huge leaps and and lots of risk and you know that's how it plays uh, and the risk averse uh, event planner is also one of the most stressful jobs and tech people are not isn't that weird like how much billions of dollars ride on those jobs and you know, you'd think how much pressure there would be but when you see those lists of the top most stressful jobs that in the world or the you know any specific country you don't see tech people in there yeah, tech developer is not usually on no, those lists. No, right? but event or planner even, is, right? 
So VC is something's not. VC, VC. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you'd think VCs would be right. They're they're essentially professional gamblers, but uh, but they're not because you know the house always wins generally. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it, there's a lot in between those two camps that that could still use a lot yeah. of communication. I think. Yeah, and I mean, tech also has that advantage that it has sort of instant signals of what's going right totally. and wrong. Events right? could, uh, and, and then yeah. that, therein lies one of the the opportunities when it comes to events is the fact that what what uh, technology lacks in in humanity, uh, events lack in uh, data based decision making. So um, there's a lot of um, monitors on tech to determine what what things are going in what way uh and events oftentimes is more of a, of a gut feeling you know and uh that's been that's been the number one thing i've uh professed when it comes to speaking over the last 15 or 20 years is has been about data uh it's to me it's the thing that is the de-stressor uh, believe it or not like it, it 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 empowers you it gives you uh tools that can get you out of a silo uh, and and make you seen as the important person that you should be. It might get you more resources and not just say we had a good year. The event was in this year, so therefore next year we will continue to have the event. And it's like, well, that's meaningless. You know, should it less, more, different, all those things. And and that's what data you know gives you. Uh, it just it, there's probably no word that is less exciting to uh, the, the standard event planner than the word data. You know, BEO is more exciting than that. Shivari <laughs> chair is more ex- kabuki well, drop. You know, but like I think it comes data, back to that risk thing again, right? Like BEO, yeah. you know what a BEO is. No matter totally. how funky Pass the fail. food is, you know what it is. Data. Checkbox. How do we deal with that? Like, how do we make planners get comfortable, feel happy about? data sources and and ultimately knowing what to do with it because that's the big one yeah because because that's you know you get providers have different ways of providing data um especially if it's a virtual event i think there's all those data points and that's just yes it's really exciting but i see a lot of people having access to data i don't Mm -hmm. see a lot of um kind of decisions being made in advance about what you're going to do with the data and when you're going to do that with the data, right? Because you theoretically could make a lot of spontaneous decisions, curate content, even decide which questions to ask and where to head based on what you're seeing in the data. But I don't think many planners can see a sort of, you know, whatever it looks like in the back end, like a Google Doc or or an Excel spreadsheet or maybe a dashboard and sort of have the awareness to plan to make decisions based on what they're seeing live, right? Yeah, I think I think they have to to hear more stories of how data was used differently. Uh, I think that the, their gut instinct is to use data uh, if they do uh, for iteratively better events, and that's probably the the extent of of their vision of what data can do. It can make it, um, let's say, more people went to this guy's session than someone else's. Therefore, let's bring him back next year. That is a use of data. I would look at it like, okay, who went to the other sessions? Uh, you know, it was only ten percent of the people, but were all of them CEOs? Interesting. So, okay, I I could say as an exhaust uh, that tells me that um, CEOs in this circle are, are very interested in this type of uh, data, and I would go to the sales team and say, are you having a hard time reaching those types of people? Um, you know, SDRs. Let's change the scripts and include content around this. Let's do content marketing with keywords around SEO. Uh, based uh, strategies that include that type of content, I'm all of a sudden infusing my entire organization with with data that I gathered from an event. But that's because I look at an event like a focus group. You know, I, I just it's a big focus group. If you pay attention and you and you look at the signals and you create opportunities where there's forks in the road, uh, specifically designed in order to determine where people are going in the same way that you would design a poll. Then all of a sudden, your event has uh, more than just let's make it better next year, but let's use the information that we gathered from people voting with their feet to uh, make better decisions for the entire organization. That's the kind of potential that I think data has. And then all of a sudden, your your event isn't pass fail on did you grow attendance, uh, where uh, the reviews mostly positive, but in fact, there's all these other derivative. Uh, uh, 
benefits that make it so you might get more investment, your 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 job is safe, you might get more tools simply because you uh, gave data as an output uh, of the event. But that makes you, you have to think like a marketer, you know, you have to think like a salesperson uh, and you can't think like just like a planner. And I'm always very cautious of most of the simple answers I have for things being it resulting in planners just need to do more. Right. You need to know, you know, I remember years of like having to do training for active shooters. Then it was all this virus. And then it was uh, we had to understand, you know, I mean, everything from foodborne allergies to political unrest in certain cities. Uh, and you have to understand uh, lighting and and how if, if, is it too many redundants or not enough redundant uh, technology that you uh, hardware that you have in your building. Then it became virtual. Should I have 365? I mean, it's so much asked. Right. And I think that's the problem. My, my only feeling is if I can empower you to pr- either create more revenue uh, or or have more wins uh, as the output of your event, maybe you can ask for more resources you know i mean i it i think if you if you can prove that you're worth more and you don't get more resources i mean this this isn't maybe fair either but i think you should go somewhere else you know but if you if you're in a good organization and you say hey like i'm gonna put a concerted effort in into this year of providing you more valuable output to the the end goals of the business through this event if i do that i can i can actually do even more than that if i had more resources so can we commit to that? Like th- those are things that you you see in marketing all the time. You know, like I say, I'll spend this much money in PPC uh, for the next three months, and if this is successful, and I determine something that is uh, turnkey, can we double down the investment? And the answer almost always is, yeah, of course, you can have twice as much money. But planners don't ask for twice as much money, uh, and it's because it's an ask, and it's not a two way street. Uh, so again, being in this kind of like place between digital and face-to-face, which really ends up being between marketing often uh, and and in-person planning. Uh, I see things like that uh, and how to negotiate like that because um, I live in both worlds. And if I was, you know, if I was focused on creating just an event, I, I wouldn't have the luxury to be able to be in both worlds. Uh, but I do. And so I try to like give that out as much as possible to say, like, if you want to solve your problems, you need to find more money. Yeah. And if you can prove that there is more money or that there is more upside, that there's <clears throat> some kind of advantage there, then you have a huge, you have an ace up your sleeve, right? You're kind of saying, look, I can show you that, that this is good, right? Yeah, I can't. There you go. I have a tattooed ace on my sleeve. Uh, I believe in that so much. Uh, it's a it's a good thing to have uh, some kind of uh, superpower, let's say, you know, and, and I, I figured out mine kind of of like this being in two worlds is my superpower um, yeah. uh, because I saw the pain and I know that like being in an intersection uh, of, of pain uh, is, is a really valuable place to be of two different pains. Um, and it's that journey for the last year and a half or almost two years uh, has taken me to conversations around the metaverse over the, uh, over at least the last year for sure. Uh, and when it comes to digital and experiences and, and that is like, the, the next level of disassociation between uh, groups of people, you know, like there's there's adamant uh, people uh, right now that are that are especially I was at IMAX this year and there was a lot of like, I don't want to ever talk about virtual events again, uh, floating in the air in the, in the planner world. And I can only imagine when the maturity of the metaverse continues, how much more there's going to be division between uh, two camps because it, it's it's poised to be, uh, you know, people talked about virtual being the replacement uh, for face to face, which is, you know, obviously, I, I mean, I think both of us understand that that's not a real thing. Um, but there were still people that felt that way. But when you start bringing in virtual architecture and uh, and 3D involved into it, it becomes more one to one. And I think that you know the way that the planner world is set up right now, uh, being against uh, technology that is trying to replace them, is what their their thoughts are. Um, then it's uh, it's more vocal. <laughs> so it's gonna be it's gonna be a wild ride for the next couple of years as far as how people react to this stuff. Good stuff. Well, let's talk about that. Um, can you take me back to the start of the pandemic? Um, you know, what were you doing? Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about your journey there. You've mentioned the metaverse, and I want to talk a little bit about your your work in that space. But also, 
you know, with someone who is in the kind of digital world and, and the live events world, a little bit like myself, um, would love to kind of get your recollection of how you live that and what your motion and what, where your energy was when you realized everybody was going to go virtual. Yeah. So I, uh, it's funny. I, I had, there's a couple of uh, my friends that also did a lot of presentations uh, pre pandemic for years on topics around hybrid events uh, and things like hub and spoke and things like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of uh, just virtual events in general. Uh, and all of us became kind of like, uh, asked for a lot during the pandemic as far as like webinars and, and those kind of things because um, we already had a lot of content on that uh, so i mean right prior to the pandemic and then at the beginning of it i was uh, working with a lot of uh, clients in my consultancy uh, who produce large scale events like like quite large um, in into as much as the hundreds of thousands and i was doing things like attendee personas uh, and uh, a lot of event data uh, hypothesis and working with the data team to to verify things, uh, and uh, and creating like organizing principles for events and such. Uh, so I was doing that, and then uh, the pandemic happened, and that that dried up pretty quickly. And I ended up being tapped for go to market strategies from so many different event technology companies that were pivoting from being an event app to a virtual event platform, or in some instances, things as disparate as. Uh, a romantic style uh, matchmaking to network virtual networking, right? So everyone was trying to get in on this world, and I was doing go to market strategies for for all these tech companies. Um, Can you break that down? What that means? I mean, people were sort of saying, "Hey, there's a big opportunity in yeah. for planners doing virtual events." You know the market. Can you help us? position ourselves more, in some way. more or less that yeah it was uh you uh a, a few different things so it was like okay we need uh a, a good like a pretty uh organized go-to-market strategy that includes um campaigning um uh, who to talk to the associations what shows to be in uh thought leadership strategies um uh, persona development for B2B, which I've done quite an extensive amount of when it comes to like the different planners from conferences to trade shows to incentives. Like I've done every, you know, 10 or 12 different personas for each one of those uh, subsets of the events industry. So I was doing a lot of that work for these tech companies that were uh, pivoting because before it was very different. An event app proposition from a marketing perspective is very different than a virtual event uh, app. A virtual event app is is running the show. So it's about design. Uh, it's about the attendee experience more so. Where the where uh, I think the feeling of event apps prior to that was most about expediency and organization. Uh, it's it's just a different uh, way to communicate. So these companies had to really quickly pivot. Uh, the ones that were already in the space and the ones that were not in the space, which I dealt with quite a few of them, they had to completely understand what, what's a planner. Are they just like any other consumer? And it's like no, no full of eccentricities uh, that <laughs> you would think this would work, but it, it won't. And in fact, this works well and uh, you wouldn't think it would. Uh, lots of that kind of stuff. So I was doing that. And one of my clients I had off and on for years was a company called All Seated, uh, is a company called All Seated. And um, I so, was... Before we go there, let me, just, sure. let me just dig into that point that you made, which I think is yeah. really interesting. When you kind of explain to people that aren't in the space what's unique about planners yeah um are you kind of coming at it from the perspective of hey every sector has its kind of idiosyncrasies and everyone does yeah yeah and, and these are no different but i kind of know a little bit more about these guys than you do or or, or do you think they're actually completely unique like planners are this completely different oh species? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that if you looked at lawyers, they're as different, you know, uh, to doctors as planners are to somebody else, right? Like there, there's things that, you know, don't say that, uh, you know, that, that will turn them off. This will turn them on, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but then there, there's things that are like more specific where they're like, oh, trade show conference, pretty much the same thing, right? It's just a bunch of people coming together. Uh, Right. And it's like, well, no, like the exhibitor is actually uh, the client and the attendee is the deliverable in a trade show. And in a conference, the attendee is uh, the client and everyone else is the sort of the deliverable. It, it's it's there's nuanced differences between 
what keeps them up at night. Uh, and really, when you're talking about marketing and, and gaining trust, it's about using their words authentically uh, and and having it seem as though that you are someone who completely understands their uh, their struggles uh, and from an emotional standpoint. Because uh, a lot of what I do is I create the uh, talk tracks and and ways to communicate. So it's a lot of it's education on this is what it's like to be somebody in this position. Like this is how stressful it is. Uh, you know, just like we talked about earlier about the failure thing. I'm like, what do you think about failure? And I would ask them that. And I'm like, all right, here's, here's a couple of videos I have of, of people I know who plan events. And this is what I told, you know, this is what I asked them and same thing. And they're like, oh my gosh, we're not on the same page. And it's like, no, you can't, you can't go at them uh, like they're you. You have to have empathy for their position, which is very different than yours. Uh, mm. No matter what, their their events not going to be moved back, you know, another quarter to get it right, you know, uh, and they and they also don't have sprints and there's all these things about you know like they're not agile, right? Like there's all these there's all these things that uh, you know from from one world to the other that that, that don't translate. So I, I try to really under help organizations understand uh, how to communicate to planners who also have I think been in some instances abused. Uh, by tech companies coming in and coming out uh, and uh, and trying to get rich quick, uh, which hasn't been successful. So their guards up, uh, mm -hmm. and they're they're extremely risk averse to the degree that like it's like insurance planners. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else would like be more uh, adv adverse to risk. To some extent, HR. There's a few groups that are just like we we don't deal in risk. You know, we deal like if you ask me and, and to tech, it's like if I were to give you this proposition, would you want the shiniest, newest, coolest thing, a little bit beta, or you know something that gets the job done, good workhorse won't even fail. I didn't know what the second option was. Yeah, like, oh, like what else? Oh. It's just yeah. Th there's that paradigm. Like they're like you know that there's there's unicorns without horns, right? And they just plow fields and like they do stuff and they're they're reliable. And they're like we just shoot for the unicorn stuff, like it, just the magic. And it's like well, yeah, they would prefer half as much uh, shiny things for twice as much uh, security. Uh, and that's, that's the game. So there's all these different, uh, ways to, uh, and you don't want to communicate the other way. Like, look, I even see like there's some of these new social media platforms that are cropping up in the wake of Twitter being weird. Uh, and they're like, look, if you're joining this, we just want to set your expectations. It, it's going to be buggy. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. And, and I can just imagine, you know, having content that's, that's aimed at the event planner world. They're like, we have the, the newest, like coolest way to network and it's like the, the it's it's really uh it's algorithmically you know uh awesome and and uh, there's lots of ai etc it might fail uh you know it, it it might not be ready for your day of but but if it does it's going to be so good <laughs> like it's a zero conversion right like they, there's just no chance uh so yeah. it's uh it's a lot of that. It's just like to have people understand that the market they're going in, that they're investing in, that um, you have to understand the rules. And the rules are are a certain way because your point of is it different than other sectors? The fact that it, it, there's a landing of, of a day or two or three uh, and that's it uh, is is very weird. You know, like the, the tent goes up, the tent goes down. That's unusual when it comes to uh, different markets and different uh, lines of business. Like if you're selling to lawyers, you know that law firm is their 365, uh, and they they can you know they can they, something can go another week. You know they can figure it out. There's no other week for this. Like the the, the date set. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I think that's something I've been looking at a lot in terms of during the pandemic. Tech moved very fast, right? It, it had to, it had that demand. Um, but before that, it feels like tech is always much slower than other industries because what you were saying, you know, the event itself only happens for a few days out of the year. Even if you're running multiple events, it's still up and down, right? It's still like, you know, powering up, powering down. And then you don't get that kind of continuous data feedback and then kind of continuous consumption. So it makes the development cycles a lot stranger, right? Because you're always adapting to that. Every development date I've ever been given uh, on a roadmap has been moved back uh, by months to longer than that. Every time, internally, with organizations that I've worked with, it, it's not. There's no firm dates. It's when it's right. 
you know, and there's all these, you know, the idioms that they use within the tech sector uh, to to combat that of saying like, if it's good enough, you know, to ship, you know, ship it or things like that, right? If it's, uh, if you're not embarrassed by your first, you know, iteration of something, then you waited too long. Like there's all these platitudes that exist within the tech world in order to motivate and spur things on because it has to be done artificially. In the events world, it's like if your event isn't, in, you know, the first event you do isn't embarrassing, uh, then you waited too long. Doesn't make sense, right? Like your first event isn't a knockout that that sets everybody's expectations up for, you know, this is going to be an amazing uh, series of events. Then no one will come to the second one. That's how they think in that. And because those are reverse, um, it's once again another reason why that these aren't natural partners and that it requires yeah. some finessing and communication to get on the same page. Absolutely. So let's go to uh, All Seated, you mentioned, which I think yeah. is kind of a big way into the metaverse. You were working with them on and off, and then you ended up in a full time role with them. Yeah. And I helped them create a, like a think tank uh, that had a bunch of people that I've, I've worked with over the years uh, Corbin Ball, David Adler. Dahlia, uh, Brant Kruger, um, Liz, uh, uh, trying to think who else is on this group, uh, Dave, uh, Jim Spellos, just the, the almost usual suspects. And, uh, you know, the people that if you, to me, it's like if I could put together a dream team, these, these would be the people on it. And uh, so we were having these, these calls with uh, UI UX and the developers uh, for months about taking what they were doing in the 2D space uh, in in room design and applying that to three dimensions and then let's pop some video in there and, and let's call this a virtual event, which everybody else was doing as we have this uh, you know list of, of things that are going on in an event. Let's pop a video into it and call it a virtual event. It's just a slightly different premise, which intrigued me because I just did go to markets on like five different uh, of the other, right? So I was like, I need something different. And and because of that, I was having staying on after the calls being like, you know, there's six other things you could do with this. And like, there's HR implications and there's all these other things. Uh, so I was kind of wooed to, uh, you know, come in full time, which I hadn't expected to be able to have or really had any interest initially in uh, working for a company full time. Uh, but I, uh, I did that. Uh, and it was, it was, it was tough. It was really hard to sell uh, a 3D platform when two things was happening during the pandemic. One, uh, the adoption of virtual events uh, for planners was at gunpoint. You know, it wasn't like they were enthusiastically choosing to do that. They they were up against the wall and they had no other choice. Uh, which which makes all of the prognosis of where these you know these platforms are like this is great. They love this. It's like no no no. They just have to use you, uh, and they have to use one of you and. What they were wired to do was, you know, as I've said before, pick the one that had the least amount of risk, which looks the most amount like the things that they expect to see based on a quickly put together um, market. So uh, there's a bunch of market leaders and everyone kind of follows and, and everything looks more to me, at least more or less the same. And here I am trying to sell an orange to a bunch of people that are that are like, you know, unenthusiastically picking apples. And uh, it was difficult. And then Mark Zuckerberg comes out of nowhere and says, uh, hey, we're we're meta now because uh, the metaverse is here and the metaverse is 3D and it's it's community uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's exchanges, it's working together and it's it's sort of events. And then we were like, oh, that's a better word, you know, than virtual event platform, which we, you know, couldn't successfully get people to think of us as. So uh, we we ran with that and there was a, a rebranding of what was then Expo into Metaverse. Uh, which you know the M E A T uh, one. I hope that Arby's owns that or somebody because that's a that's a great name. I really somebody owns it. I was trying to buy it, but uh, so we were M E E T uh, averse. And uh, so from from like November of last year to you know November of this year, I had been working on on developing that uh, on trying to find a market fit and working a lot with um, Gartner to understand where they think this is in different sectors and like where's where's the opportunity and it's when i understood more and more why facebook did what they did uh then i was like oh okay not only there was the like sort of i don't even want to say conspiracy theory because it's it's like so obvious that it was a pr move to be able to uh change the conversation around them of being like the villains of the past and and to be the heroes of the future uh, so there was that element of it, of like strategically when they said it. Uh, and then second, it was because the more I did research on the, the concept of Web3, 
uh, which is nebulous and, and probably more or less meaningless. But like, you know, the next generation of the Internet, like where we'll probably know what Web3 is, you know, far after Web3 is, you know, into it or over. Um, everything that everyone's saying about what they want from the Internet moving forward is everything that Facebook is not. Uh, it's in opposition to them. You know, it's it's we want our data. We want we don't want some you know person who created hot or not to be able to you know have this much power. Uh, we we want uh, decentralized uh, you know everything, and uh, we want it to make it in a way that is more human. And you know, he's dehumanized communication and and centralized data. So he must have seen that coming of saying, oh, oh, this is where I become obsolete. You know, this is where this is what replaces me. So he bought the flag of the future uh, and is, is just sitting there hoping that he has enough money to wait until the future is here. And it's not here. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. It is absolutely not. It, it's, it's very much like a this is a time to play around, which if it's not your money, which it wasn't mine, it's great. You know, I'm like, I'm learning stuff. I'm, I'm learning about what the prototypical metaverse, because I still believe it, it will be, you know, whatever it's called will be a thing. Uh, like what will be the building blocks? Like how do humans react to this? Like when you design a 3D experience, uh, what what are the learning lessons? And I got to watch people do that. Like there was little things where an event in a 3D space, someone would say, after the speaker is over, come back to the bar and uh, you can have a conversation uh, with that that person. And I'm like, oh, it's great that they used physical objects as a reference point um, organically. And I just little things like that. I'm like, that's great. Like that is slightly more mm -hmm. human than saying, click on the box to the left, uh, you know, and and follow the link to the chat room of that. All of that is not human speak, right? So uh, I like a lot of that. So it was like little lessons that I was picking up when I'm like years from now when this is going to be more relevant. Uh, I'm like, okay, I, I know how to design better in this space in order to, you know, but that's not my money, right? So like yeah, yeah. It, the money so runs out when interesting example because okay, so I'm watching this keynote. Um mm -hmm. doesn't matter the platform, but then it says go to the bar and you get to interact, ask questions to the keynote, right? And then mm -hmm. so I'm guessing if I'm in a 3D environment, I have to then move my avatar or move myself, um, mm -hmm. figure out where I am in this space, figure out where the bar is, you know, probably a few keystrokes, arrow, joystick, mouse, wherever you're going to sure. like surf around, then you end up in this environment and then you're in a breakout style environment, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of where you would end up. That's what the bar would probably be to make, to facilitate that in interaction, right? Yeah. The, the other option to that is, Click on the button that shows up to my left to go and have a conversation with the speaker that you've just heard, right? Yeah. In my mind, I'm thinking that's way easier. Like, yes, I get it's kind of fun to find the bar, but if I can just yeah, click on the button, more and than fun. go there. Yeah, it's more than that, fun though. Does that, so, does that help though, or is that just yeah, us sort of thinking that hey, everybody wants to hang out in the metaverse, and actually they don't. They just so go so that the exists. Seat. To totally that sentiment exists of like, let's just try to make this happen. But it, I, I'm getting in, into the, the psychology of it. So like, especially when I watch my, my eight year old in Roblox and like his ability to create memories in a digital space and, 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 and deal with content in a way that he can reference it later. And it has an impact on him is greater mm -hmm. enhanced by, by a, a sense of presence and permanence because there was a space that he did that. So he would reference, remember that thing in, the, in that house over there that we went through that had that slide? Like that is memory markers rooted into how we are built as people. Meanwhile, remember that thing that someone said in chat? gets blurred with every other platform and experience like that. So it depends on your goals. But if your yeah. goals are to create actual change, uh, be having them being rooted in, in an emotional uh, uh, space that includes presence uh, and memory markers is a big deal. So yeah. it, it really depends. Now, and all that stuff has to be, you know, most of us in the tech space, like we're so wired for expediency. And in fact, the virtual event platforms, like that's where they started, right? Like they started exclusively in a, in a place where an, an app is faster and better than a binder. You know, I remember going to, to conferences with a big giant binder. So oh, like I they're about a lot of planners still do, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, well they, the planners have them too. But as an attendee, I remember getting a giant oh, binder yeah, yeah. and that was my app. You know, I was like looking through this thing and it was insane. Yeah. Planners so still do have binders. Uh, so yeah, two, two things come to mind here, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, sure. One is I, I see, I, I still feel like 
it may be an extra barrier, but you know, let's go with this. Um, on one side, I see sort of this like Twitter versus Instagram kind of mm-hmm. notion here where I'm very much in the Twitter sphere, you know, like, or any other kind of more text based social media where you're searching text or you're finding these things and you're making comments and you're doing that. Um, and that's sort of how I navigate my way around. But I could see a lot of planners who are, you know, doing a lot of stuff on Instagram prefer very much the visual approach, right? They don't totally. want to know what to search for or whatever. They just want to like see an image. They like it. They kind of figure it out. They kind of go. And so there's that element of, I don't really need the whole text context thing around totally. it. I can just go towards this thing that I find interesting. And I think from that perspective, it's it's interesting because you sort of- The metaverse you know, is not going to replace- go Google. You almost let go of the, I guess, web two kind of infrastructure in that sense. Totally. I, I think Web 2 and Web 3 are actually going to live uh, a lot of the applications in uh, in sync. Like, I, I don't think that uh, I don't believe that a lot of the, the the ways that we get information from Web 2 are going to disappear simply because there is Web 3. Like, I think uh, that there is a lot of need for um content to be just content and not to be an experience. But I think that there's also missing right now from uh, the digital world are our digital experiences. Uh, and it, it will probably shake out that there'll be certain times where it makes sense to uh, to create an experience and then certain times to to host content. Uh, yeah. But at least there'll be an alternative and at least there'll be there'll be options. But there's a lot, a lot of friction between uh, that aspirational goal of, of what would people are talking about the metaverse and in 2022 and frankly 2023. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, but I mean, there, there's, there's a, there's good signs there. And ultimately I just really care about what it takes to bring people together. Like I'm still that person who, you know, is a teenager saying like, where's my tribe, where's my group, you know, and I'm go, I'll go anywhere. Like I went from going to online forums for, you know, Star Trek and X-Files and stuff like that to finding shows and, and finding the live events with that and, and loving that too, like as a consumer, as an attendee. Uh, and I yeah. think that like, and it's a different level and I think that they can, they can play into each other. They can springboard and it, it's very cyclical. Uh, it, it's not in opposition and it's, it's harmonious. And I think virtual has been there and hasn't had a fair shake yet as far as in a world where yeah. it's not mandatory. Uh, and we're finding out where it sits in the pecking order now. Uh, and then I think that this next bridge will be a third option. Eventually. Okay. One quick question to to elaborate. You mentioned Roblox, and I think a lot of people, you know, talk about the experiences on Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft. A lot of kind of, yeah, especially I do all those younger things. generations living in those spaces and kind of mm-hmm. being there. Very much so. But one thing I see that's quite different is that even on the simpler level of Fortnite and Roblox, from what I understand of it, it's quite complex. It's quite dense. There's a million different worlds in there, right? And yeah. when we build virtual events. As much as we can put, you know, hundreds of sessions or whatever, it's a relatively simple environment. Like there's not yeah. actually that much to discover. And most of it is sort of, hey, we built a 3D convention center because people feel familiar with it. So then you can explore, you know, room A, room B, and room C. So I feel like a lot of what happens on Roblox and Minecraft is the fact that there's so much to discover. You go and kind of find your path and there's a million different options. And Those are also fun too. And then the other thing that you exactly. described is, is the discovery fun. is part of the fun, <laughs> right? It's not yeah. just like, oh, there's yeah. a serious conversation here and there's a serious conversation there, right? Yeah. So I feel like, yes, those are good examples, but unless we can build virtual events that are fun, and have mm. that depth where you have a million different choices and actually things lead to places that you're not really expecting and necessarily control, I don't think they're comparable in, in many ways because we're like, this is a sort of sterile they're environment. They're not one-to-one. You add, you know, a little bit of content. Yeah, they're, they're, I honestly, I look at like almost a fortnight to a, a B2B, uh, let's call it 3D, you know, uh, event uh, in the same way that I look at uh, a, a B2B event and a, a sports, uh, experience, right? So you, you go, oh man, like I want to create a sense of, you know, energy and excitement and belonging and all these things from in my dentist, you know, uh, conference. Uh, and then yeah. you're like, and then over here, here's sports where people literally lawyers have shirts off painted in colors 
uh, dedicated to the arbitrary city that they grew up in. Right. So yeah. it, it is and it like at, at a different level of maturity as far as the realization of that. And because it's centered around something that is effortless, effortlessly fun uh, versus something that is sort of mandatorily done. So I, I think that it's more of a place in, now do B2B events. Do they have the ability to learn from a Disney's, you know, surprise and delight and a, uh, you know, a, a Kanye concerts way that they have, you know, I'm a bad example in 2022, uh, some Taylor Swift, Oh, a bad example of 2022, uh, some, some concert that you would want to, or could go to, uh, and, um, see the energy that's happening there in a one-to-one -one way. No, your dentist conference is not going to be the same. It's not going to be, you know, uh, lit as the kids say. Uh, but it, it is an <laughs> element that has like, there is a, an ethos or an energy or something like that, that you could borrow to in, make it, you know, incrementally better. And I think that's what Fortnite or, or things like this that are playing in those sp spaces right now offer to people who are designing, uh, you know, things in our space. Um, they, yeah. I, I watch it for more of like, okay, like sense of presence is a big one. Like the example I gave with my, with my kid, you know, like he, he has memories from spaces more than he has memories from, from 2d content consumption. And with that, you can build on that. So from a design perspective, you, you have to think about, okay, you know, you're not going to necessarily get a gun and shoot people in your dentist conference like you would in a Fortnite, a Fortnite. Uh, but is there something about gaming and gamification and points and teams and randomness? And, you know, like, what are the, what are the broad elements of this that could be applied? Uh, so I look at the inspiration from it as opposed to one to one because one to one it gets crushed. It's just not fun, you know. Like it's getting lost versus discovery, right? Like those are kind of like the big difference. Like you can get lost in the big conference uh, hall digital twin, uh, but you don't get lost in Fortnite. You discover things. I'm yeah. doing that now in the new Pokemon game. Like I'm, I'm playing that, and I'm like, it's a, it's an open world thing. So I'm just finding stuff. And and if I was at a trade show, and I'm like. Uh, I don't want to endlessly for days and days and days try try to find the booth I want to go to, right? Like at a certain point, th this is you know this is business. This is you know not what I'm you know doing for joy. Uh, and you know we have to create ways to you know inject as much joy as pos as possible. But it's not it's never going to be one to one. Like it, your your uh, your trade show is never going to be as exciting as the Super Bowl. Sorry, like it, it just isn't. <laughs> Uh, but it doesn't mean that you don't look at the Super Bowl for uh, tips on how to keep people's attention and how to tell stories and how to you know create emotional connection. You do. You just know that like your expectation shouldn't be you know on par. Yeah, I love it. I think that that's totally right. Do you think that the next generation is actually going to be playing a virtual game live rather than attending a virtual conference, or is that too far. I think I think anything that when that has a conversation on replacing things is too far and uh, missing the point. Uh, there's a lot of you know back and forth. You know, like virtual ups this game. You know, the, the fact that like I think I look at, think of content as a way of like man, do I as a forty some year old person not want to experience as much content at a live event as I used to? I'm happy to listen to podcasts watch YouTube videos uh, and, and find all the other easy ways it is to get content. When I go to live events, I'm craving the hallways and the people and I want more of that. So um, that is not virtual isn't replacing it. It's changing my appetite. Uh, and maybe it's making it should be at least pushing content at live events to change and be more interactive or be something that's more pure that can only exist in live. So I think that it's likely going to change how we do things, I hope, versus replace. Uh, because when I go to like a, geez, even uh, I, I didn't go this year, but like New York Comic Con, it's like over 250,000 paying attendees in addition to the uh, all of the people that are there for uh, exhibition. It's, um, you know, it's that's that same group of people that are playing Roblox. They're not like not going to that thing. They still crave community, still crave in person. Uh, but the things that are there in that and granted, that's a B2C space. But, it, you know, for we're, we're trying to do apples to apples here. Uh, that that's still people who are enthusiastically taking part in in a community around something and esports. You know the, the, what's growing in that is is the live events themselves. Like the um, I mean 
there's as many as you know multiple millions. I think five million was the new um, record a couple weeks ago uh, for League of Legends um, that were uh, uh, concurrently watching uh, a stream, and that like doesn't include China, which is probably you know could be as much as double that. And uh, but the live events are growing and growing, and they're they're creating different experiences for the live events. So my hope. Uh, and and all I think all indicators are showing that it's not about the replacement of it's about the change of like do we need you know all parts that we were in uh, from a time when the only sh- uh, game in town was live events I don't think so you know I think that a lot of the things that we did at, at live events or we've in the habit of doing are because there was no alternative like I like a flipped classroom as an example of a model I, I really I love the idea of and I I wish it was adopted more where I got, we got all our content ahead of time and we went to the event and we, and we got together and we connected and we talked about what we learned and we did that in practical ways. And there was workshops and things like that. I like that. And I hope that eventually once I think that the dust settles on like running back to 2019 style events is which what I'm seeing currently, I'm hoping that there's still an opportunity for innovation in the face of it. I think that ultimately, no matter what, it's going to happen because there's going to be a whole new generation of people that's that are less inclined to sit in a lecture for 45 minutes. Uh, and they're more inclined to, you know, binge it, you know, when they want to, or, or they're, you know, running or, or doing whatever else they're doing. Um, and they're, but I still think that, that humanity craves humanity regardless. Uh, so that part's not going away. I love it. Good motivation for events and planners all around and for tech companies to, to figure it out. Uh, if there's demand, somebody will figure it out, right? Yeah, it, it's they're they're adding, they're going back and forth uh, right now. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for them to work together, certainly. Uh, but at the point we're at right now, it's one is pushing the other, uh, and I just I want both to succeed. I'm I'm a rising tide person. I, I want tech to succeed and be uh, the tools that 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 are needed in order to get to the next level. Uh, I've been in both camps. I, I don't really I don't have a preference. I just my preference is people coming together. Uh, and however that is done at the in the best way possible, like I, I, there's a lot of people that root for one side versus the other. This is right and this is wrong. People are the side I'm on, and whatever it takes. Like we learned a lot of lessons during the pandemic around inclusion uh, and whole people who are underserved in live events because live live events cater to people who are primed and ready to get in a plane and be around thousands of people. And we left everyone else in the dust. And in those two years, we learned that there's lots of contributing members of communities who didn't have a voice uh, and they had one. And I don't want to go backwards on that. Uh, And I also don't want to take away live events. I think there's an opportunity for everyone to to participate uh, and in the way that they want to. And it just takes both sides sitting at the table and and working, working out their, their issues. Yeah, for sure. Nick, it's been a pleasure. Um, really interesting conversation. We could talk about this for hours, but let's make sure that our uh, podcast guests uh, <laughs> yeah. wrap up soon. Uh, and, and, and kind of, um, you know, we can do a follow-up conversation at some point. Would love to get your recommendation for somebody else that we absolutely should in, invite on the podcast and maybe something that you would uh, would ask uh, him or her yeah yeah i mean uh i get a lot of inspiration from a gentleman named greg bogue uh at the merits uh, global events uh team uh for, in design studio uh and he's their chief experience officer um he is just so smart um he just thinks about things from a completely different point i think most of us are we all say the same things because we talk about the same stuff all the time. And I think he's uh, he's coming at things from a completely different angle uh, around pure design and design thinking. Uh, and if I were to ask him something, you know, I would ask him, I would ask him about uh, our, our 3D events uh, inherently uh, in digital 3D events inherently um, inevitable uh, or or could we, you know, potentially not go that route because it's not what people want. Um I'd be I'd be curious to hear what he has to say about this because he's also pretty impartial as far as um, what uh, whatever it takes. To, that's what design thinking tells you. It really it's a it's a methodology that you know has you try things and have an open mind. Uh, so I'm uh, I like I like hearing from people with open minds as opposed to people with agendas trying to sell stuff. <laughs> <laughs> love it really appreciate the recommendation uh, it would be great to have Greg on the show Nick it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for joining us and sharing some of your thoughts and uh, where can people find you if they want to follow up or connect or anything like that 
Yeah, yeah. I'm super easy to find. I'm on every single social media uh, that is still around. Uh, we'll see, you know, when this air drops, if, or if they're all still there. But it's just N-I-C-K-B-O-R-E-L-L-I. Uh, it's nick at nickborelli.com for email. And then social media is just my name. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate your Thank time. Thank you.